gonna be prepared. You're going to be out there doing things. Run by a woman. Yeah, I think so. The thing about it is what fit in the So, hello, and, and thank you all for coming, and uh, welcome to the town forest. How many people have uh, never been here before? Um, so, I'm, just, I'm Martin Langefeld. I'm the, the uh, perpetrator of this event. And um, I'm just here to introduce our, our guides, which is uh, Bill Gunther. He's the Wyndham County Forester. And Bob Zano, who's with the Wildlife Department. I'm not Fish and Wildlife Department. And Laura LaPierre, who's the director of the Wetlands Programs for the... For the Department of Environmental Department. Okay, so there we go. So, uh, and um, uh, I see a lot of water bottles, but if anybody wants a bottle of water to take along on the hike, it's, it's a little climbing. It's going to get warm. So take a bottle if you'd like, and uh, I'll turn it over to whichever one of you guys wants to start. Okay, I guess, I guess I'll start. start. Uh, I'd, I'd like, like to welcome, welcome everybody, a uh, wonderful crowd today on this uh, 80 degree evening in April, and <laughs> this yeah. lover is not happy today. <laughs> I was hoping we'd be walking on snow, but I'm sure most of you are probably happy. I shouldn't say that too loudly. Um, Martin uh, sent me an email a while back and asked if we could put a, a tour together because there's been a lot of interest in this property and we'll talk a little bit uh, later on some of the wetlands classification issues about this property. Um, I've been associated off and on with the property for about, about 30 years since I, I moved down from my home up in Sutro, Vermont. Uh, it's a wonderful property. Uh, we're blessed that we have Paul Miller here, who is the son of Mater Miller. And Paul, I, if you're okay with it, I'd like to have you maybe say a few words about the forest, some of the thoughts of your dad and what he was thinking and trying to do out here. Yeah. <clears throat> well, uh, some of you probably knew my dad. He was a selectman in town for one stretch, I know 27 years. But he was very active and he was really interested in preserving this this particular property because it was at a time when uh, development was you know completely unchecked and as such he was you know he wanted to make sure it was held so that it wouldn't be developed at the time now my dad uh, marked out these some of these trails that we'll be hiking tonight and he established boundaries which we had no idea where boundaries were up here I mean it was it was just no man's land, I guess you'd say. <laughs> and it abuts the fish and game up here, so they kind of run together, which makes it even that much more uh, enviable. A um, couple things about my dad. I do have his walking stick that has walked many miles. It's a mountain maple. Uh, it's got a nail in the end that's been worn out a couple times, I guess. And I, I climbed Mount Monadnock here in October, September, that last of September, to celebrate my 80th birthday because he did it on the, his 80th birthday. And of course, this had to go long. <laughs> so anyway, there's a lot of tradition here. Uh, I'm sure that this is fulfilling the very ideas and visions that my dad had of seeing this used, preserved to a great extent naturally, but then again, to see it used for. Uh, you know, people's hiking and for education and so forth. There are a few rare plants in the swamp itself. Uh, there's a group here from, oh, what's the college over there? Antioch. Antioch. It's working. Last, last fall when I came up here, there were about 30 people here in a class doing various research projects on a graduate level. So this place is used, and therefore we want you to pretty much stay on the trails, but don't feel that you have to. Anyway, that's kind of it. Um, on behalf of my dad, I'd like to welcome everybody to the J. Maynard Miller 
municipal oh. forest. <laughs> Thank you, Paul. Uh, I'd like to say a few other introductory words, and then I'll turn it over to my, my two colleagues. Um, the forest was purchased in 1973, and who remembers a key event that was happening in 1973? You've got to be a little, there are going to be some people here who weren't even the born then. Always the gas. <laughs> Mm -hmm. And that was one of the other reasons why the uh, Arab oil crisis in 1973 when OPEC decided to shut off the spigot. So at that time, firewood became that much more important in Vermont because fuel oil just went through the roof uh, when that happened. So that was one of the other reasons that the town decided to purchase it. Um, I look back into some history, and when they bought it in 73, it was four, it's 450 acres. They spent $175,000 for it, $389 an acre. That sounds cheap today, but that was an awful lot of money uh, in that particular period of time. So as Paul said, uh, you know, development pressures were happening, um, and watershed protection was an important reason. Now another rumor that I heard, maybe you can confirm this, Paul, but I heard another rumor in town. Somebody was telling me second, third hand that the town also decided to buy it because there were a whole lot of hippie communes in the area, and the town thought maybe we better hang on to this so it doesn't get developed into a commune. I'm afraid that was a factor, yes. <laughs> 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 oh, I might have let out a town secret there. <laughs> we were just going through the Vermont Yankee development, just started producing it, so the town was in quite a turmoil. Yeah, <laughs> a lot of things going on. <laughs> um, so the, the featured tree that we're going to see tonight is uh, is black gum. Uh, it's also called Nissa sylvatica. That's the Latin name for us foresters, and it means water nymph of the forest. And this is a very unique place you're going to see tonight. There are places in New England where there are black gums, but this is about the only place really where it's the predominant species. And we'll talk a lot more when we get up there. Um, the trees are, we believe, we haven't aged them exactly, but we think they're somewhere the larger ones in the, in, in the vicinity of 400 to 450 years old. So with that background, I'll let Bob uh, and then Laura maybe just give a few introductory comments. Sure. Uh, so again, my name is Bob Zeno. I'm with the Vermont Fish and Wildlife Department. and. Uh, specifically with the Natural Heritage Program in that department, and we are tasked with uh, keeping track, finding and keeping track of the rare and, and special uh, features that are out there on the landscape. So rare animals, rare plants, and then rare natural communities. And the black gum we're gonna see tonight and the swamps, uh, both are really among those rare special places, as Bill was saying. I don't wanna steal all your thunder on that. Um, Can't say too much for this so, place. <laughs> So we look at uh, everything from the soils, the, the ecological processes, and then the, the plants and animals that are in these communities. So I'd encourage you, uh, feel free to ask me questions about, you know, what's this plant? What is this? I don't know if I'll be able to answer all of them, but I'll sure give it a shot. And then I feel obligated to introduce my walking stick. This is a soil sampler. So if, if we have time and, and interest, we can look at the peat soils that's in these wetlands. Great. So um, for those of you who've just arrived, my name is Laura LaPierre. I'm the manager of the Vermont Wetlands Program and the Department of Environmental Conservation, which um, all three agencies actually fall under the umbrella of the Agency of Natural Resources. And my job is to protect wetlands in the state, to manage wetlands in the state, to ensure that um, there's no loss of acreage or function and value of those wetlands. Um, today we're, we're going to be experiencing um, the recreational value of these swamps, the aesthetic value of these swamps. They're also really important uh, natural communities and wildlife habitat and such. And in the state of Vermont, we have a three-tier system for protection. Um, and so you've all probably heard a bit about the Class 1 designation, an effort that went through this past um, June through um, January, where the Agency um, of Natural Resources decided that we wanted to um, 
use the the highest level of protection that we have um, for some particular wetlands. So class one designation means that um, these is, is reserved for those wetlands which are um, really irreplaceable wetlands where if you were to impact them, you wouldn't be able to create a, a wetland similar like it elsewhere. Once it's once it's impacted, it's gone. Um, and so, um, in the state, we have a permitting system for impacts to wetlands and uh, their buffer zones. So the adjacent land next to the wetlands um, can also affect what happens to the functions and values of the wetlands there too. Um, and we went around the state and looked at the cream of the crop of wetlands and decided that these black gum swamps are really unique and special in the state of Vermont and were worthy of the class one designation. Um, so we went through an effort of um, designating them. However, there was still a lot of um, questions from the Vernon community. So we decided to not go forward with the class one designation right at that um, that very day in January, but do more outreach, such as today, and in two weeks I'll be at the town hall to talk more about the, the regulatory piece. Today's the, more the fun day. We're going to actually go out and look at the swamps and experience them firsthand. Um, but in a couple of weeks I'll be down here to talk more about the, the regulations and what it actually means to become a Class 1 wetland and whether or not there's support for uh, going forward with that designation as well. So I'm here today to you know, answer your questions about uh, the, the regulatory framework, if you have any, um, and also to, um, to um, experience the wetlands with you and, and experience their functions and values today. So thank you all for coming. This is a great turnout. Um, one other thing I wanted to mention, um, Back in 1988, in Vermont Life, there was a great article written about Maynard Miller. Um, so for those of you that may have old copies around, I don't know if you can, you can Google it. If anybody wants a copy, I could, could send it to you. Um, but there's a picture of Maynard, and it talks about him hiking up Monadnock on his 80th birthday. And congratulations, Paul. <laughs> You'll be going up it on your 90th yeah. and your 100th, I'm sure, too. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and the last thing I want to say is, um, I've been with the, uh, the State of Vermont Forest Parks and Recreation Department now for, oh boy, 33 years, I guess. And uh, I think like anybody, we all set goals of things we want to do. And one of the many things I had hoped to do somewhere in my career was to have a program with all the ANR sister agencies involved in the Agency of Natural Resources made up of my department, Forest Parks and Recreation, Environmental Conservation, which Laura works for, and Fish and Wildlife, which Bob works for. So it only took 33 years, but we finally got a program where, all, where the whole agency is represented. <laughs> and I want to thank you guys for making the, the long trip down. I'm a little local, but we traveled a few miles. So with that, I think we'll, we'll head off and walk. We've got a big group. What we'll try to do is make sure that we stop so everybody can hear. It's going to be a little hard. Um, I think I did this once with 72 people. <laughs> so we'll do the best that we can. We do want to be cautious when we get to the swamp itself. Uh, there's only one area that I like to take people out in so we're not trampling it to death. Um, also, there are some sort of stops that uh, I, I make each time I do this tour, some interesting things we'll see, and a lot of these are things that your dad pointed out to me, Paul, so um, like the, the sap sucker tree, for instance, we got to stop at that, and a few other things, so uh, hopefully everybody can hear, if you can't, raise your hand and speak up, but it is going to be a little tough in some parts of the trail for us all to sort of stay together and hear each other, but we'll do the best we can. Anybody have any questions before we head out? Nope. Okay, let's go for a walk. Anybody ask for water? Water? <laughs> <laughs>
What? Yes. <laughs> I think he's probably the good. I would like to see too. But I'm interested in This will be our first stop here. This one involves a quiz. <laughs> okay, I think we almost got everybody. Uh, first part of the evening is uh, a quiz question. You didn't know this was going to be a quiz, but there is a quiz question. Um, in this part of Vermont, there is something that is impacting are hemlock trees. What might that be? If you were a forester or natural resources professional, though, you can't raise your hand, but. Woolly adelgid, all right. Hearing that from a number of folks, yes. Um, it's a small insect, it's, uh, it's non-native. Uh, you see these little white cottony balls on the underside of the needles. That is actually not the insect. The insect is inside of that little ball, and you really need about a 30-power lens to see it. The insect is, is that small. Um, we found it in Wyndham County, I think it was here 10 years ago, found it in a lady's backyard, beautiful row of hemlocks in Brattleboro, and it was sort of off to the races. It's now found in 16 of the 23 towns in Wyndham County. Uh, it was not found on this forest, however, until just a few years ago, even though we had other sites in Vernon. And it was a really freaky occurrence the way it happened. There was a, a workshop for foresters and we were mostly looking at the timber harvesting activities on the forest and I was asked by the uh, folks putting that together, well would you give a tour of the, the black gum swamps? And I said sure. So we're coming from one end of the forest to the other and I got a question from one of the foresters up north, well can you tell me what hemlock woolly delgid looks like? And I said well, um, I, we don't have it on this forest, so I can't show it to you, but I'll show you how we sample. So we stopped, I'm next to a hemlock, I reach up to this tree, flip the needles over, and there's HWA as we call it for short. So, so we did find it here, although that was the only tree and the only branch. We looked at ten other trees in a circle, so I don't know if it was some weird message from above, but it is here now, unfortunately. Um, our trees are holding their own. Um, it definitely stresses them. We don't think it's going to kill them. We, we haven't found a tree yet that we've said it's killed, but it's definitely a, a stress on trees. So our second quiz question is, and again, foresters can't raise their hands, but um, look around you, and where is the first black gum tree? There's a black gum tree within sight of where everybody is. Look around and what looks a little different? Yeah, that right there. Yep. <laughs> this one right here. See if we can find any of the leaves. The leaves are pretty well crumbed. The leaves tend to fall off quite early on that particular species, but uh, that's what it looks like when it's a little smaller. Uh, we're going to see some that are considerably larger than that. 
Uh, they do have a beautiful fall color if you happen to catch it at the right time. Crimson, crimson red. Just a beautiful color. It's not going to give you all kinds of oranges, but if you like pretty deep, rich reds, it'll give you that. Um, Bob or Laura, any other comments yet before we continue on? Nope. Okay. For those who have not seen hemlock woolly adelgid, I'm going to pass this around. Normally I would not do that because we don't want to spread it around, but it's already here. So if you look on the underside of the needles, you'll see these little white balls. So if you haven't seen it, that's what it looks like. And there's a, another sample of it. Uh, folks, we got a couple of tree questions that I'll, I'll try to answer while folks are coming along. One question was, uh, lady's got a blue spruce that's looking really bad. The lower branches are really looking poor and dying off and the needles are falling off, I assume. Yeah, um, well that we can likely attribute to climate change issues. Our weather is definitely getting more humid, it's getting warmer. And what do funguses like? Those kind of conditions. There's a fungus called, and I've got to give you the Latin name because I don't know the common, my apologies, but it's called Rhizosphera needlecast. And while you're seeing the bottom of the tree impacted more than the top, the lower down you go, you've got more moisture and less airflow. As you go up in the tree, the tree will look better. Most of us have probably noticed on our white native white pine, We've seen a lot of browning of the needles, or they turn kind of actually a pretty gold color, and then they turn brown and fall off. And you'll notice that situation, you'll see the lowest part of the tree impacted the worst, and the top may be left untouched. Similar thing there. Those funguses are going to have a better growth medium down low than up high, and they lose their needles. And we're very concerned about the white pine. We've identified four pathogens so far. We're not sure exactly how they interact. The Forest Service is working with my department closely on a lot of research. We hope to learn more because it's a very important tree economically for many reasons. And in the case of the spruces, uh, ornamental spruces have really taken it pretty hard. So if you have white spruce or blue spruce especially, they will be susceptible to the rhizosphera. Uh, another question that came up was, are there any other critters or things out there impacting hemlock? And yes, unfortunately there is. There's another invasive insect called elongate hemlock scale. And that one again, it's non-native. We found it first in Guilford and then Vernon. Um, a lot of things, you know, sort of creep up from the south and we're the gateway county. So my colleagues up in, let's say, Caledonia or Essex County, they didn't know what hemlock woolly delgid looked like till I brought them down here on a tour because they just, they haven't seen it yet. So elongate hemlock scale, um, it, you'll see it on the needles. It's a little hard to describe. Those of you that are computer savvy, if you Google it, there's some great pictures on the internet. But again, EHS, elongate hemlock scale. What we're finding is if trees are impacted by both of those species, then things start looking pretty bad. Uh, the way forest stressors tend to work is one plus one doesn't necessarily equal two, and kind of similar in human beings. If you get some kind of affliction or bug that knocks you down, and then another one jumps on you at the same time, often the combined impact is worse. And that's the case often with insects or diseases. If you have one and you add another, the total impact may be more difficult. Um, so we're watching several trees that do have both of those involved. We're holding our breath, but we can't say that we found a single tree yet that has been killed solely by either insect, but they definitely weaken them. In Luck Vermont. Yeah, in, in Vermont, thank you, yeah. 
so we're we're very happy to see that uh, you know we're getting more moisture. We had a you know pretty good snow winter, so we're coming out of the drought. Drought is an abiotic stress on trees. So if you have drought, and you have a couple of these other things going on, they really multiply itself. Uh, so our stop here. This is uh, what Maynard called the the sap sucker tree. Looks like somebody was shooting a shotgun at it. What do we think might have caused that? Yes. Looks like a shotgun blast. <laughs> yeah, it's a, it's a bird that's in the woodpecker family, and it likes to peck, make holes, and uh, where's Patty? Over here. Patty. Yes, uh, would you like to make a couple of comments about their, their relationship? What happens with the, with the set, whatnot? Oh, well, I, I would just like to say that they're a great boon for hummingbirds to show up here before there are flowers out. I think mean, hummingbirds go to these sap yeah. sucker holes and get the sap. Yep. And also probably the insects that are Exactly, around. yeah. Mm. yeah. I didn't realize the hummingbird relationship, yeah. though. Yeah, because my understanding was is they peck the holes, the sap leads, insects are attracted, and then the birds can come back and feed on the insects. But in this case, the hummingbird is actually feeding on the, yeah. on the sap itself. So is it a perpetuating thing? I mean, so here's, here's a, it's a <laughs> knock, there's plenty of other ones right around. But this one is just peppered. <laughs> Why this one, Bill? Yeah. Where's Bob? Bob, uh, any co particular comments on um, sap suckers? One thing I've always been intrigued by, and I've, I've heard some wildlifers use the term that if a tree continually gets attacked, it's what's called a sweet tree. Is that a, a, a phrase you've heard before? I've heard that too. I don't, I don't have any science to say for sure that it's, it's particularly good, but I mean, you see this like a yep. <laughs> yeah, and this 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 is one of the great mysteries, and this is what I love about forestry and the woods. We don't have everything figured out. You know, we we've got a lot of things figured out in science, but I love the fact that I can come out here and scratch my head and read all kinds of research papers, and then we get to the conclusion we don't know. <laughs> Um, it'd be boring if we had the whole world figured out. Plus, <laughs> nobody would believe you. usually attack hemlock. Well, it's a very strange mix, and that's yeah. one of the things I was going to point out about this bird. They go after things that anatomically and chemically are not similar at all. Hemlock, you mentioned apple. They will, a little less on occasion, go after sugar maple but they don't seem to like red maple, sort of close cousin. They will go after paper birch. One species they love to go after is in the genus Sorbus, the mountain ashes. And basically, if you were called me on the phone and said, gee, what do you think about planting a mountain ash on my front lawn? I would say, um, well, the sapsucker is technically a protected bird, and unless <laughs> you want to build a cage around it, don't plant a mountain ash. But I had to stop here. Maynard always brought me here every time, so every time I bring a group out, we got to see the sapsucker tree. Uh, we're getting very close to the swamp now. It's right over there, so we'll head back up to the trail. I want to caution folks, though. We're going to get down a little farther, and there is a junction. Do not take the trail to the right unless you want a lot longer hike tonight. <laughs> Bear to the left. <laughs> Bob, if I can put you on the spot. <laughs> uh, maybe a little discussion on our two sort of shrub species that we're seeing, uh, the laurel and the uh, viburnum. Yeah, so do, uh, can, we, can we just call out the name for each of these? I bet people know what they are. So this one is? Uh, 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 yep, so call me a latifolia. And then this one over here with the, it's actually a flower, wow. Yeah, that is. Uh, so that one is, starts with an H, cobble bush. Or, uh, uh, let's see, I think it's now viburnum lantanoides. Oh, lantanoides, they changed, it used to be alnifolium, yeah. wasn't it? Yep. So they like to change the scientific names. Lantanoides? Uh, cobble, uh, just, you know, two fun facts about this. Cobble bush is, is widespread throughout the state, as you probably know, you can find it. Uh, it's, it's everywhere from here down in the southern Connecticut River Valley up to uh, practically the top of Mount Mansfield. The mountain laurel is, is really characteristic of 
this part of Vermont and uh, and maybe a few areas around Bennington. So, but these forests are, are unique. Uh, we're here mostly to look at the black gum swamp with this this combination of the hemlocks and oaks and the mountain laurel with a really distinctive forest pattern here in the state and, and also cool and, and worthy of noting. Yeah. I don't see much in the way of barberry. It's so invasive. It is invasive. Right. Yeah, I haven't seen it on this plot. You can lots of invasive plants in, in forests that have a long history of of use, uh, particularly if they were ever cleared for agriculture. Places that have remained forests for a long time, you don't tend to see a lot of invasives, and I think they just they can't get in. And when they do get in, there, they're still shaded out by the other species. So, or you will not to have a lot of them. Any idea what that big tree in the back is over? <laughs> That's the black gum. Yes. Yeah, I'm gonna walk. I'm gonna walk us out. We're not all gonna probably get, be able to get out there at the same time, and I'm not sure how damp it's gonna be. Um, where did Laura end up? In the back. Laura, any other thoughts or comments? Yep. Oh, okay. Um, Bob, one question I had though on the uh, on the hobble bush. Um, Elevational gradients, I mean, I, I think of it as usually higher elevations, so I was surprised when I first walked this and saw it here, because we're not that high. I mean, we're well under 1,000 feet here. Yeah, um, I think of that too. I think of it as a northern hardwood species, but, uh, so there's sugar maple forest, but clearly it's here, and I guess well, plants are where they are. <laughs> um, when we were out here with Howard Wise Tisman in uh, in December, uh, we did a Laura and I did a little walk around with him, and we we talked about the, the property and toured around. And uh, I think the phrase I used, I said, I think this is one of southeastern Vermont's most treasured ecological sites. I mean, it truly is unique. Uh, one comment we had or heard earlier was, well, for Vermont, but for Vermont, yes, what we're seeing here, I mean, if you went a few hundred miles south of here, this may not be as, as unique, but for where we are in the Green Mountain State, this is very, very, very unique. I mean, I, I still get Google-eyed when I come out here. I'm like a kid in a candy store, just, whoa, I get, just get excited about it. Um, Bob, are you familiar with uh, maybe uh, giving folks a little background on kettle swamps? Yeah, sure. No. So, the, uh, you know, there's a bunch of ways that wetlands can form, and they can be everything from flats on slopes, and then like what we've got here, where the, the landscape actually forms a basin that is trapping water, and there's this, uh, you know, this small area, which actually we can practically, we can probably see all of it. There's this ridge that runs all the way around the swamp, and the swamp's out there, and it all funnels down in big bowl, or kettle, and the, the water accumulates there, and over time you get this accumulation of plant matter building up this, this heat. The, the mosses in the wetlands that then forms this, this basin of swamp and these unique conditions. So you have a very small area where the water is coming in and um, I guess I, I'm blanking on whether or not there's an outlet over there, but not a lot of outflow of water in contrast to other swamps where you might have a lot of water coming in and then uh, flowing through and moving out. Do you think this was glacial likely in origin? Uh, Good question. I don't know. I'm guessing it would be bedrock, but I don't know. That. Well, the glacial kettle hole model is a big chunk of ice that gets covered over, and then it melts <laughs> out, and you're left with a kettle formed pond, like in the outer cave, and in any <coughs> outwash deposit. Because we, we have had that question come up sometimes in debate, you know, is it a, a glacial kettle swamp? Yeah, more of a geological thing. If you started digging around here, you wouldn't get very deep into the ground. Mm -hmm. It hit rock. And I think that would be bedrock again. It's possible there's some other geology going on there, but like, I always guess that bedrock is the controlling factor. Mm -hmm. Bedrock kettle. Okay. Okay, uh, we're going to walk out, uh, and again, um, we're not going to get everybody out there probably, so we might have to sort of do this in, in shifts. Um, 
But I guess if, if Bob and Laura could accompany me out there, because there are going to be some questions that come up probably that I'm, I'm not qualified to answer that they may do a little better. But we're going to head out right through here. <laughs> Actually, it's a little drier than I thought it was going to be, considering the, the snow cover we had. Okay, folks, I hope people can hear me. Uh, I know everybody can't quite crowd around this, but this is a good sized black gum right here. Uh, there's a little smaller one there. Uh, another one over here. Um, and we get questions a lot of times, how old are these trees? Uh, there was a Marlboro grad student years ago that took a couple of cores from here. And uh, unfortunately, as you get to the center of the tree, though, there was some rot. So she had to interpolate a little bit. But she was pretty convinced back in the early 80s that they were right around 400 years old. So. We're looking at something that's probably, you know, at another 30 to 40 years to that, uh, which is, is certainly within the ballpark uh, how long this particular tree species would live. Um, and Bob, I may have to reach out to you on this so question. Tree but Columbus. Yes, yes. Um, over in um, Rockingham County, New Hampshire. Um, do you know Dan Sperduto? Yeah, I was actually, I was just looking at his report. Yeah, did he come up with, was it 500 and something or 600? He got, got some trees that were over 600. Over six. Okay, I want to say I thought 638 years maybe. Okay. Where was that? Well, it's over in Rockingham County, um, New Hampshire. It's in southern New Hampshire. A um, uh, classmate of mine at UVM, Dan Sperduto, uh, was the ecologist for the Society for the Protection of New Hampshire Forest. And I ran into Dan at a meeting, hadn't seen him for a while, and I was really intrigued when I heard that they've got a 630-year-old deciduous tree over there in New Hampshire. And I said, well, geez, Dan, where is it? And he said, Rockingham County. I said, uh, oh, well, whereabouts in Rockingham County? And he said, Rockingham County. <laughs> so, so I couldn't get it out of him. But I had to respect that because he didn't want people trampling, I mean, just just the impact we're having tonight, we're definitely, you know, compressing root systems a little bit, and there is, a, there is an impact. So you could imagine if hordes of people went to see this tree, that the impact would be certainly less than positive, uh, which is why I don't like to take anybody any farther out in the swamp. Um, if you want to do it and you're dying to do it, please wait for a winter when we got a good freeze up. And we got good snow cover. That way you're going to disturb things the least. Um, but the trees are, are pretty special. You can see they've got some very interesting shape. Um, I kind of like the aesthetic of them. And one thing I'd like everybody to try to look at before we leave, but the tree right here in front of me, what I'm looking at on the bark are very deep furrows, about an inch, inch and a half deep. Yet when you get on the other side of the tree, there are bark plates, but the furrows are almost flat. And we started a big debate in the natural resource community about, well, what, what causes that? You know, and one thought was, as well, it's the direction of the tree faces, and yet, no, that's not really it, because the aspect varies on these. But there was one theory that it may have to do with the fact virtually none of them are perfectly straight, that it may have something to do with where water accumulates on the tree when it freezes, and that may have an impact. But 
Again, these are, these are theories. One of the things that both drives me nuts about forestry, wanting to know everything, and yet one of the joys of forestry is that we don't know a whole lot of stuff out here. I mean, we've got all this great science, but there are many things out here in the woods that we're still scratching our head at. And not a day goes by that I think, wow, I've never seen that before. I wonder how that works. So you can't always put things in a nice, neat box. So the fact that we're not exactly sure how that bark pattern occurred, I'm just living with that and just enjoying it. It's just the great diversity of our woods. What would, would have been here 400 years ago for them to grow in this spot? And what else was here then, do you think? Ooh. What, did they, what do people hypothesize about that? That one I may, may punt to, to Bob. I think he may have some better <laughs> thoughts on that one than me being an ecologist. So I would guess that the, the forest both here in the swamp and uh, out there on the hillside <clears throat> probably didn't look all that different. It would have been, with a few exceptions. Uh, what we're looking at here is probably forest that has been uh, harvested before, uh, whether recently or, or hundreds of years ago. And so we're looking at younger trees than would have been here at the time. And uh, we might have seen more uh, broken trees, more evidence of, of things like wind and ice storms. Uh, and then there's one big thing that would have been here that's not really here now, and I'm guessing that's not a mystery, and many of you know this, that the American chestnut probably would have played a really important role in these forests. Not in the swamp, but it would have been in the uplands around. Ah, oh, and that's going to be a quiz question a little later in the tour. <laughs> Stay tuned for more answers. <laughs> what are the other three species that surround us? Uh, what are the other tree species uh, all around us? Here in the wetland? So uh, we have hemlocks that are out here. Much of what we're seeing is hemlock. Uh, let's see. Winter tree idea on the fly is always fun. It looks like uh, yellow birch out there. Some yellow. Yeah. Uh, I don't know. Do you see black birch out here? Uh, I've not found any black actually in the swamp around the edges. Uh, Acer rubrum, yes. red maple. Red maple. Or sometimes called soft maple. And you see probably not much for ash out here, right? No. So. I think I, t two wet of feet, I think. And I think we got a Picea rubens right there. Don't we, that uh, large sa seedling straight ahead? It would take Red spruce. Over here, Bob, you mentioned um, harvest, and I don't know if this is the case, but this looks like some stump sprouts right here, right, Bill? So mm -hmm. here... You can kind of see the, the old woody material of, of the stump that's disintegrating, but um, this uh, red maple really wants to survive, and so it it's, has all of these sprouts coming out, and, and sometimes you can tell how big the stump was, or the, the original tree, by looking at the circumference of, of the circle of, of smaller trees. Um, another thing to note, is that we're today we're looking at one black gum swamp. I think this one is three acres. I think this was the three acre one. Yeah. yeah the the lar there's there's more than one black gum swamp in the town forest. There are actually seven black gum swamps um, scattered throughout the town forest and the wildlife uh, management area over at Roaring Brook. That's uh, just over there. <laughs> that way. Yeah. <laughs> some there, some there, yep. <laughs> um, and, and the majority of the black gum swamps are on the um, town forest, and um, some of them just kiss the Massachusetts border. Um, do, do we see another um, area with pit and mounds, Bill? Um, this is probably one of the better examples. It's not quite as apparent as we get around to the other right. side, so that's, that's probably a good thing to, to mention. Yeah, so we have um, a pit and mound topography in here, hummocks and hollows, which creates a lot of diversity in the, the level of um, water saturation. So you can have wetter plants down in the, the ponded areas, 
and drier species such as hemlock up on the hummocks. And um, throughout these swamps, one of the, the very important functions is that um, amphibian species really need small pocket yeah. wetlands like this to uh, small um, ephemeral vernal pools to, to breed in. Um, does anybody here have a lot of chirping going on around their house? Yeah. <laughs> so that's a clear indication that you probably have a vernal pool um, where you live. Um, and interesting species. That, that sound that you're hearing are called, those are spring peepers. Really tiny little beige colored um, frogs that get quiet as soon as you get close to them, so they're really hard to find. So if you see them, there are lots of um, hollows in these swamps that have water long enough for, um, in, for wood frogs, spotted salamanders, and blue spotted salamanders, um, which are big, fat, what they call mole salamanders that live underground most of their life stage. Um, they come in swarms this time of year and um, breed in the pools and um, <coughs> have these great big um, egg masses of, of multiple eggs that um, hatch into pollywogs and, and larvae. And as long as the, the pool doesn't have any predaceous species, uh, they're able to grow into juvenile and, and come up into the uplands. So wait, I have a quick question. So is this uh, considered a bog? What's the difference with a bog in a swamp? And a wetland. <laughs> so they're all, um, a wetland is, is more the overarching um, definition of areas that are saturated or, or inundated with water. They're not quite lakes, they're not streams, they're, they're this in-between where maybe certain times of year there's water and there isn't. Um, a bog, a fen, um, a swamp, they're all um, different types of wetlands. And um, bogs are areas that primarily receive their, their water from, from rain. There's a buildup of, of peat um, so that they're not, they're not receiving as much water um, from the ground. So this more. is groundwater fed here? No. The swamp anyone? is a discharge so Groundwater discharge. Swamps don't have that peat accumulation. Right. Um, that may be more of a geological thing. The failed pond fills in, fills in, fills in because it isn't, it's not big enough to have a kind of wave action to oxidize the plant matter and then it fills up with and becomes a, a bog, a quaking bog with sphagnum moss. That's like the the glacial kettle hole theory of the origin of a quaking bog versus it stays as a lake. That's demonstrated out in the other cave. So this, if this isn't a kettle hole bog, then it's probably a swamp mm -hmm. based on how... So, um, and this is officially classified mm -hmm. as a red maple black gum swamp. swamp. Yeah. Uh, Okay, well I wanted to stop here for a couple of reasons. One, as you could see, you went through a real wet area, so you were literally walking through the edge of the swamp. That's because of the, the ledges come right down literally to the, the water. And one of the things that we talked about doing to try to protect this area a little more was the possibility of putting in some boardwalk there. And that w was a question that came up, well, what could we or could we not do with the class one designation and Laura this is where I'll, I'll need to draw you in if I could uh, so the idea of the the boardwalk my understanding is since putting that in would actually be enhancing the potential protection limiting you know footsteps that that would in all probability be a, a very likely permitted use Now, we have a whole list of allowed uses, which 
Uh, many of them are really passive uses that we don't, don't find to really harm the wetland. Some of them actually enhance the wetland and such. And back at the uh, parking lot, I have a whole pile of um, handouts of the allowed uses. And one of them is for restoration of a wetland area. And so to Right now, everybody's walking through and really compacting the soil in that portion of the wetland. Um, where if um, if we were to put a boardwalk in there, that would be um, one. There's there's an allowance for for boardwalks as well, as long as they're not incredibly wide and suffocating the wetland. Um, but in that area, I think a small boardwalk would do a lot to enhance the trail experience right there, and also um, help protect uh, this section of the lab. So what do you call it now? No, it's uh, the, the allowed uses and exemptions are um, for class two and class one. Methods. Oh, you have to notify. It's, um, we have um, best management practices on how to construct boardwalk. But would the town have to apply for a permit? No. No. Who would pay for it? Who would pay for the boardwalk? Yes. Um, Mexico. Program, which is a is a regulatory program where we evaluate what's in presence, the functions and values. Um, So that would be up to the landowner or the interested party that wants to put in those small boardwalks. Are there grants out there for that? There are grants. Um, Vermont has the, uh, Bill, correct me if I'm wrong on this, but the Rec Trails Program, Recreation Trails Program, run through the Department of Forest Parks and Recreation is a, is a source of funding where you apply for a grant uh, with a trail project. Yep, you took the words right out of my mouth. Thanks, Bob. Um, yeah, the uh, Recreational Trails Program, uh, it's federal dollars that get, that's given to the states. It comes to my department to our recreation section, and then groups apply for various levels of funding. I can give you one example where it was used. Uh, for a number of years, I was on the Newfane Conservation Commission. When we built our new town garage, we only wanted 10 acres, but the guy that owned the land said, you buy the whole 160 or none of it. We needed a new garage, we needed that location, so we bought it and we got a town forest sort of by, by default. And then we decided that since we had very little recreation in the, the midsection of the West River Valley, we'd put a trail system in. Well, we put it in. Um, and we got something usable, but it wasn't really that great. It wasn't really hardened. It didn't have good water bars. It didn't have nice bridges. So we applied for a recreational trails grant, and we were able, we were successful two years in a row, and it wasn't chump change. We got about uh, $15,000 each year, and we used that to hire one of the Vermont Youth Conservation Corps crews that I worked with as clerk of the works, and we got a lot of neat trail work done. So that would certainly be an option for the town of Vernon here. Uh, it doesn't pay for everything. It's 50-50, but they're very liberal on the matching. So if you have some volunteer labor helping out, all of that can be included. Bottom line was we were able to work things out in Newfane where it didn't cost the town actually a penny of taxpayer dollars because we had a lot of volunteer help. So um, that's what I think would be a good route for the, the town of Vernon to go with would be to use the Recreational Trails Grant. Uh, the program has still survived this year. It's still there. You know, who knows what's going to happen in the future. We're hopeful. But it's done a whole lot of good things. And everything from tiny little organizations to the Green Mountain Club to the uh, vast association, the snowmobile uh, group in the state, uh, have all benefited from those dollars. So uh, that would be a really good use of it here. Um, as you went through that wet area, every time I go through there, I think of one of the tours I let out here where I typically say, you know, please wear appropriate footwear. And had a guy that 
he showed up, I'm looking at him in the parking lot, and he's got these loafers on. And they almost look like slippers, and by God, we got to that spot, and it was a rainy section. He stepped through that, his foot came out, the loafer was about a foot down in the mud. So, <laughs> so that would be a good spot maybe for us to, to have a little bit of a, a boardwalk put in. Um, another thing I want to mention about impact, um, when trees grow up, what's happening underneath? What's underground? Roots, right. And those roots represent, you know, generally about uh, 15, 18 percent or so of the tree. There's that much mass there. Well, it was originally thought that roots traveled radially about as far as the drip line of the tree. And that way, you know, if you were doing activities, construction, or something that would disturb them, as long as you were, you know, right out past that drip line, it was okay. And that was typical in construction activities. Well, we have since learned that those roots may actually go two to three times farther in radius than the drip line of the tree. And I'll give you one anomaly. This was a weird one, but it, it was proven by, uh, by a DNA test. Um, Dr. Dennis Ryan, who headed the arboriculture program at UMass for many years, was interested in looking at this, trying to figure out, you know, well, how do you, how do you have construction activities or compaction or human use and not impact the trees? He was looking at microscopic, now we're talking not big roots, but tiny, tiny little microscopic root hairs. He found a root hair from an apple tree that was 226 feet away from the tree. And I checked my notes, and I had it underlined three times, and I asked him, did I hear right? 226 feet away, and an apple tree's crown, the radius might be 20 feet. Just like that back to what does that mean here? We're, we're stepping on a lot of root zones, and when the ground is soft, that compaction could be more so, which is why our department and the Green Mountain Club encourages folks to stay off, especially the high mountain trails, like we don't want folks going up Mount Mansfield or Camel's Hump right now because of that damage. Want to try to keep people on, on drier ground. I mean, this never totally dries out here, but I think if we were able to add some boardwalk, it would, it would enhance that protection and then lessen some of that potential root damage that may happen on the trees. Any questions before we move along? I was not up last fall. That's an excellent question. Uh, was anybody anybody in town that hikes it regularly got a, a thought or a comment on that? The question was, what did the swamp look like last fall at the height of the drought? So September would have been probably about the time it was worse off. I've always seen water here, whatever time of the year. It never really you know, gets dried or parched. Yep, OK. And even the stretch back there, it was still wet, Martin? Yep. Okay. Um, any other questions before we we move along? What's killing all the beaches? What's killing all the beaches? Ah, okay. Uh, beach bark disease. Um, it's actually a two-stage process. There's something called a predisposing agent. It's not a vector. A vector is something that actually carries the disease, but there's a predisposing agent called the beach bark scale. And if you look very closely at most beaches, you'll see little white flecks, little white flecks that almost look like a hemlock woolly adelgid. If you had a field microscope, again, they're very small, and you peeled back those little white flecks, you'd find a very small insect, and that's called the beech bark scale. It's a non-native insect. And what I mean by a predisposing agent, it predisposes the tree to something that's going to follow. And what follows is a windborne fungus known as nectria, or nectria canker. It's got a Latin name that long. I won't bore you with that. But, but this nectria fungus now has a way to get into the tree. It typically can't get into the tree unless there's a wound. But once these little insects feed on the bark, they make microscopic holes. It's like us. We get a cut, and we want to put a Band-Aid on to keep bad guys, to keep the germs out. But once that scale hits, 
and if the f windborne fungus is blowing around and impacts that opening, then it has a way to get inside the tree. The fungus starts growing, and instead of beech having this nice smooth bark, and beech is the only tree that when it gets huge, it can still have smooth bark. We measured a huge beech in Brattleboro. I'm trying to get it on the big tree registry if the landowner will allow it. So I'm not going to say where it is, but this thing is huge. You know, it's more than three feet in diameter, and the bark is perfectly smooth. It looks like a you know a three-inch diameter tree, and those trees are very very rare. So. What we typically do as foresters, if we're managing an area for timber, we often want to leave those trees that don't show any sign of that bark disease. Because as the disease progresses, it'll cause a blistering effect, and then it eventually it'll create these sunken or depressed cankers on the tree. It often doesn't kill the tree. What often kills the tree is the tree is weakened by the canker because the fungus is consuming the, the solid woody tissue, kind of turning it to mush. And then the tree is susceptible to failure by ice, snow, wind, or other abiotic events. I mean, it can kill the tree, but it moves so slow that usually it's a wind or an ice event that kills the tree. And most of our beach get impacted. It's rare that... I mean, there, there are very few resistant trees out there. Um, a tree can be infected and still have use as a forest product. It makes great firewood, but you can also use it for pellets and some other low-grade things. It's not an easy wood to work with, so we don't often see it in real high-end products, but it is part of our ecosystem. Uh, luckily, we have such a proliferation of beech that I don't uh, see that we're going to lose the species anytime soon. Um, but we're going to have a lot of diseased trees out there, but it sure makes good firewood. When you look at the BTUs of it, it actually has more P BTUs per cord than uh, rock maple has. So, real good firewood. What's that dead, that one? It's not quite dead. The one leaning out? Yeah. Ah, okay, this is an interesting one, and thank you for, for bringing that up, Bob. Um, we, Maynard used to call this the leaning tree. And... <clears throat> Until about, oh, 10 years ago, that tree was about six feet off the ground. I should have brought this tonight, but when we did a tour one year, Susan Smallhair from the Rutland Herald came along and uh, got this great picture of four kids sitting on the tree kind of up off the ground, and just the, the neatest picture. It was one of those kind of foggy nights. And, well, it's nice to be out here tonight. What is really intriguing is to come out here on one of those still foggy nights because it gets this sort of medieval-like feeling to it. And then you really feel like you're in even that much more of a special place than it already is. But even out here on a nice day, it's still a good place to be. Okay, we'll continue along. What species is that? Uh, that's the gum that's over. It's a lot living gum. Yep. But see how different the bark is on it. Yes, and we're going to see that up here. We're going to see tree. some fairly smooth bark and then the deep so that's furrowing. Tree. That's a, that's a yeah. Tree yep. Maybe your biggest <laughs> one is laying down. You know, I should measure that. I should measure that one. I never have, Bob. Thanks for the tip. <laughs> yeah, right. yeah. You know, it's kind of undercover. Problem is, I'm going to lose a lot on height out there, though. <laughs> you measure uh, oh, circumference, right. one inch is a point, and then on height, the, but the well, circumference win, is most important. You, it could be one of the oldest. Yes. Or the largest in, in the largest. circumference, at yeah. least. See, look, yeah. We need, we need to get a, <laughs> some students in here to do yeah. all these measurements. Yes. The, the little circles. Those are lichens. Oh, they don't that's harm the, the tree. Beginning of lichens. Yep. <laughs> this is a good tree to look at, folks, oh, to see that difference in the bark. Wow. It goes half out too hollow. Yep. <laughs> yeah, I'm waiting for, for that to come down one of these days. It's amazing how long they'll live that way. But it's, is it, is it, is it dead? Nope, still going. Wow. Well, I see a lot of goes up and down the bark, right? The old, the old growth maple trees will do that. And those several ones don't walk in there. Stay in the side. Yeah, I've seen that. They almost look like animals. Yeah, that's Ah, 
finally cooling off a little bit. Whew. Boy, scorcher today. It hit 81 in town. Folks, we're going to be stopping shortly about where the front people are. Okay, folks, uh, this is sort of our last talking point stop before we head out of the swamp. We're sort of right on the edge of it now, um, and we're not that far from the cars. We're just going to go up a rise down a moderately steep little hill, and cars are right over there. But uh, I'd like to stop at this particular spot because there's something kind of special around us. And uh, Bob mentioned tree species a little earlier tonight that we have not seen yet a native tree species that was likely a pretty strong component of this forest. Somebody asked, well, what was here 400 years ago? So this is the next quiz question. We'll see how well everyone was listening when Bob was speaking. What tree sp and foresters, you, you can't, I'm sorry, you got you to gotta hold back, please. Um, what tree species did Bob mention before that likely was part of this forest 400 years ago? Oh, right. Wow, we got a smart group out here. Okay. Paying attention here. Hey. All right. <laughs> Does anybody see any chestnuts? Yes. Here's one here, one there, one over there, another one back there. Another one there. It's a very rot resistant wood. So if it's not lying on the ground, it takes a long time to break down. And I took out my jackknife one day and poked through that. And you know, it's, it's reasonably sound when you get a little ways in. So the, the chestnut was killed by the chestnut blight that came through. Uh, again, another invasive, these nasty things that come our way. Um, and I very, fungus. excuse me? Fungus. Yes, it is a fungus, yeah. Uh, and Dothea parasitica, for those that want the, the Latin. Um, but it's a beautiful tree, or was. There are still sprouts of it that come up that do not seem to get uh, impacted immediately. However, something has changed with this fungus. There used to be some trees that could survive it. After I was down here for a few years, I had to kind of relearn a lot of tree species because a lot of things grow down here that don't grow in northern Windsor County. Um, and then I started seeing these chestnut sprouts around. That would, and some of them were getting pretty big. So I did a little bit of research, and there was a lot of work going on trying to create a disease-resistant chestnut. And in the studies I had done, I found that this fungus typically gets in a tree through some sort of wound. And as trees grow up in a natural forest, when you look at this hemlock here, for instance, you'll see there's dead branch stubs. And the reason for that is, is as the forest grows up and those lower branches get shaded, they don't get enough light to survive. Sometimes they slough off. Sometimes they're persistent, like they are in this particular tree. But those dead branch stubs are technically a wound or an entry point for things to get into the tree, like any other kind of wound, a tree falling into another tree, or if there's timber harvesting going on and one tree bangs into another, that can create a wound. So I had about five significant trees, chestnuts, that I was following. When I say significant, 10 inches or larger that were disease-free. and. Every, I tried to do it every year, every other year, I would um, visit these trees. And there was one out here uh, over that next hill ways. It was 13 inches in diameter. And thinking back to this situation of wounding, I was trying to think, okay, what can I do to try to keep this tree around as long as possible? And my theory was, if I could cut competing trees around the chestnut and keep those lower limbs alive as long as possible and not let them get shaded, that might allow that tree a longer, longer life. So. Uh, every other year or so, I'd, I'd come out of here, throw my chainsaw over my shoulder and chaps, and hike off to that area, and I'd 
start cutting things and I finally had a pretty pretty damn big circle around this nice chestnut and it looked great but one year something happened and what funguses can do sometimes they're, they're this gets real complicated but they can do some very strange things and there's a term called hypervirulence and what likely happened this particular year it could have been some weather conditions but I really think that there was something some kind of mutation or change in that endothia parasitica that allowed it to attack these trees that had not and in that one summer every single one of those trees I was following became infected and I just uh, the challenges so um, so the best laid work didn't didn't quite happen but uh, one of the things that uh, they have a disease resistant varietal they're planning they are working on it yes the question is uh, it's difficult to do. I mean, the American Chestnut Foundation thinks they finally got it, but you've got to cross these things with disease-resistant varieties, and then you've got to grow something long enough to see if it's mature enough or as to whether or not it's going to be disease-resistant. So these things don't happen overnight, but the American Chestnut Foundation, you can Google them or go to acf.org, they're pretty sure they finally got it. And the chestnut had so many great attributes. It grew huge, it grew tall, straight, had wonderful rot resistant lumber, was a wonderful wildlife food. And is Ian Martin still here somewhere? Or did he take, I think he took off. Uh, Ian found, uh, this is what the leaf looks like. It looks a little bit like a beech. This came off a sprout, was from over near the, uh, the sap sucker tree. But that's often how long they get. They have uh, pretty apparent teeth or, or large serrations on the edge of the leaf. Um, but yeah, they're usually about eight or nine inches long. Um, in the Brattleboro area, there are a number of Chinese chestnuts that have been planted that sort of look okay, but they just don't have the same form. They don't get as large. And the leaf looks a little different. The leaf's more waxier, and it's a little bit smaller than this. Actually, the Scott Farm in Dummerston is an interesting place where they've got a lot of odd things there. Uh, Fred Holbrook, when he lived there, uh, seemed to have a penchant for putting a lot of strange things in the ground besides apples, and too. Horse chestnut. I think we got some horse chestnuts. Horse chestnut, yes, which isn't it's technically a true chestnut. It's in the, the Buckeye family. Um, we're actually the best example of a horse chestnut, if you want to see one, I think it's the corner of Cherry Street and Maple, right across from Thompson House, and it's in, uh, it's in full leaf and bloom. There's a really neat one there, and it makes a you know, big, huge fruit that you, don't, you want to be careful <laughs> picking that up. But it is in the, uh, it's technically in the Buckeye family. Um, in a way, I groaned when we had to learn all these Latin names at UVM, but, uh, but some are, are kind of cool. Uh, the, the Latin name for horse chestnut is Aesculus, is the genus Hippocastinum, Aesculus Hippocastinum. So the, only, the one good thing about Latin, at least it's phonetic. Uh, <laughs> so it's not like some languages like English that are very weird. You say a word, and it's like, how do you spell it? <laughs> um, but we're hopeful that uh, the Chestnut Foundation is, will be successful in, uh, in having this uh, disease-resistant variety. Um, I'm looking forward to it. I know they've planted them out in a number of nurseries, and some of their large donors have them. So they've tried to distribute them throughout the tree's native range. And they did come up, up the Connecticut Valley. But like many, many tree species, there are a number of things that have their northern extent at about the windsor Wyndham County line. When I came down here, I had to scratch my head thinking, oh, wow, they got black birch here. We didn't have black birch up in central or northern Vermont. Uh, some of the hickories pretty much stop roughly around Springfield, again, at the windsor Wyndham County line. White oak's another good example. Yeah, these guys, for sure. Uh, the cottonwoods grow up to maybe White River Junction. Uh, I've been trying to find the northernmost sycamore in the Connecticut Valley, and the farthest I found, it's actually on the wrong side of the river. It's in Cornish, New Hampshire, at uh, St. Gaudens National Monument. But I haven't found any farther north than, than that. So if anybody finds a sycamore farther north, then well, that would be across from Windsor. Let me know.
Uh, any other questions before we, we're gonna head from here straight back to the parking lot, and then I will be happy to answer any questions that folks have, um, but a couple of parting words before we sort of get on the move is, um, I hope you've gotten a sense tonight how special this area is. It, it truly is unique. It's an ecological treasure, and through the, the vision of Maynard Miller, um, it's here for all of us to enjoy and appreciate. Um, and I'm hopeful, I mean, it'll be the town's decision, but I'm hopeful that the town would, would see it fitting to designate this as a, a class one wetland. Uh, I don't think it would really create restrictions that are gonna impact the town in a, in a negative way, but it's gonna offer a certain level of protections. Um, and I think in a way it can be a, a sort of an yeah, ecological yeah. badge of honor, if you will, to have that classification. Um, Laura, how many total class ones do we have in the state now? Six. Six, okay. So we have over 250,000 acres of wetland in the state of Vermont, and just six wetlands that are class one designated. Mm -hmm. So this one could be part of a elite and unique club. <laughs> uh, any other closing thoughts before we, we head on, on down? And uh, where, you're, where you're standing right now is within the 50-foot buffer zone, um, which is, is currently a, a protection that the, these wetlands have. Um, activities within the wetland and 50 feet from the wetland are areas that the wetland program reviews to ensure that um, they're not going to harm the integrity. Um, so I, I hope that you, you can come to our meeting May 8th um, to discuss uh, the designation and whether or not we should be moving forward with it. So thank you for coming today. Bob, uh, other comments, thoughts? Uh, I think you've said it well, both of you, and uh, it's just great to see so many people coming out to get to explore and study and hopefully appreciate this place. Thank you for coming. Uh, okay, well, we'll enter up the, the trail and out towards the parking lot. Okay. Do that one. Oh, okay. Uh, okay. Uh, okay. Uh, 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 uh,